Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session with me on stage. Two people who already know each other and have got the conversation going already. We're, we're having we're a, already private, started. We're a private exactly. conversation. Yeah. We'll try and include you guys as well then. Next to me is Glenn Hutchins, who's co-chair of the Brookings Foundation, uh, the chairman of North Island, and the co-founder of private equity firm Silver Lake, as well as a lot of other things, but we'll be here all day if I carry on with your work, Glenn. So, um, next to him is Sir Martin Sorrell. Uh, we'll drop the, the titles on the land of the Republic. <laughs> um, Sir Martin Sorrell is executive chairman of S4 Capital, digital advertising firm with a global footprint. Uh, Martin was CEO of WPP, as you probably well know, for more than three decades. Like Glenn, Martin has a wealth of practical experience and the subject of our discussion here, which is how to prepare for the next global economic slowdown. We've already had Lawrence Boone and Angel Goria tell you about the slowdown that's underway. So let me start by asking both of you just how bad you think the next slowdown will be and when you expect we will see the trough. You're going to drop me right in it. So, um not terrible, not, not 2009, not 2001, two, or, okay. or the early 90s, uh, which were probably the, the three that I remember most vividly, um, but, um, but tough, I think. And when, I mean, I, I saw a, a commentary that um, many clients of, uh, wealthy clients of, uh, uh, private investment banks were looking at uh, at a recession uh, or a, a significant slowdown in 2020. I I, I think it'll probably happen. I mean, just it's, it's a worthless, uh, probably exercise to try and forecast it, but I'll have a go. I would say prior to the U.S. election, the market will exhibit jit jitters. Um, so round about September, October, I think that's when, you know, the, the vice will start to, start to tighten. Um, Glenn will have a view as to who's going to be elected or re-elected. I, I, I think Trump at the moment, I listened uh, last night to um, former Secretary of State and um, at a private, private do, so. Um, which was interesting, but I think the general view is that the best Democratic candidate would be Biden. Um, Michael Bloomberg is obviously having a look at it, but I think that's more a, a, a wait and see exercise. He's sort of going to see how the the cards fall. So, on that basis, I think Trump probably gets reelected. But but the polls apparently say that Biden has the best chance of the Democratic. Uh, candidates, uh, so we, we, we'll see, but we'll get on to other other topics. So I would say slow down, um, you know, bumping al bumping along the bottom, not a, a severe downturn, and, and it'll start to bite. I would say third quarter of next year. Glenn. Well, um, economies don't die of old age, uh, and so there's no. The people just seem to think that we're going to enter some recession just because it's been a long time since the last one. Uh, that just doesn't happen. Uh, so you have to think through kind of what the cause of some sort of economic downturn might be, and as a result of understanding the cause, think through kind of what shape it might take. So today's major uh, problems are kind of twofold. One is, 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 uh, is temporary um, and created by our politicians, which is the uncertainty around trade uh, and the restructuring of supply chains that go with that. So that's got China slowing down and has some meaningful effect on Europe because the export, so particularly the, the European, European economic engine, Japan to China are slowing down. So you, you're seeing in those parts of the world a slowdown on this recession. But secondly, I think the bubble right now is, and notably in the world is, this massive um, flow of capital into uh, passive investing and in index funds, driving very, very high levels, historically high levels for stock markets around the world. Um, it's ironic that people are all focused on a downturn when we have equity markets at the highest we've ever seen them. You felt very seldom have those two discussions happening simultaneously. Uh, so if those, and if, if that blows off, you have a recession that looks a lot more like the recession of 2000 where equity values are down. There's a mild wealth effect. Uh, consumption goes down for a brief time period, but the uh, that downturn is uh, shallow and uh, short. Yeah, just to... 
if you said to me, so a slightly different question, what is the thing that worries me most? You know, we have 2,000 people in 20 countries. We're capitalized at about a billion dollars, uh, having started only, only a year ago. So we're sort of a, a mini global firm, if you like. The biggest thing that worries me is the, um, the G2 conflict. So the, the, the trade war, which has obviously had a, or the trade tiff or whatever you want to call it between the US and China has obviously had an impact on trade and GDP, even in its sort of earliest stages, is sort of like, to my mind, the tip of the iceberg. The, the real problem, Brexit is not a sideshow, but relatively to what I'm gonna say is the biggest issue, it is a sideshow. The biggest issue in my mind is America's failure to, to understand uh, what's happened in China o over the last 20, 30 years, uh, and that the Chinese are not going to go away. Uh, and just listening to the president yesterday at the New York Economic Club, um, there is this sort of um, nationalist eco economic uh, concern about the rise of China. And it is that friction, and I have no answers, and very few people I listen to, because I listen to people who may, may have the answers, very few people have answers to that. But it's the failure of America to accept the rise of China. China has been on the wrong side of history for 200 years. Uh, I'm picking up on Glenn's point you know, as to what, what is the major determinant. I, I think that's the major friction, and that's the major thing that we have to deal with. And just coming back to the White House for a minute, if Trump was defeated by Elizabeth Warren, um, I don't think it would be any better, or by Bernie Sanders would be any better. Maybe with Biden in the White House, it would be a bit more, quotes unquote, balanced. But I worry about that. Right. Glenn, you've sort of touched on this when you spoke about valuations, equity valuations and things in the past. Let me ask you, monetary policy has thrown the kitchen sink at the problem since the global financial crisis. Fiscal policy, as Laurent says, is starting to get started uh, on helping if it's not already done it. Do you think this is actually helpful during the next downturn that we see coming, or are there the seeds of future problems being sown? The, the balance of monetary and fiscal policies, policy tools. Well, look, since the, in, in the United States, since the great financial crisis, we've pretty much only had monetary policy as a policy tool because our government has been, our U.S. government has been arteriosclerotic. I uh, haven't been able to get anything done, and if anything, uh, they actually were um, moving against economic growth by having something called the sequester in which um, fiscal stimulus was declining as opposed to increasing. Um, uh, one of the things I've said about the Trump administration is they're not even bad, and they're not even particularly good at being bad, um, which is that um, uh, they attempted a fiscal stimulus uh, which hit in 2018. Uh, why they did it in 2018 rather than timing it for 2020 is beyond me. Uh, but that's when they did it. So that fiscal stimulus is now behind us with the Democrats in control of Congress. It's not repeating itself. Uh, and one of the great questions about uh, the U.S. economy is why spending about $1.5 trillion only got us a half a point of trend growth. In other words, the prediction... The, the, the complaint was that the Obama economy had been 2% per year. The prediction was that the release of animal spirits and the reduction of government and the increase of spending was going get, to gonna get that to 3 or 4% and way beyond because we were going to unleash all sorts of, uh, of uh, uh, hiring and investment. And the result for 2018 looks like it was 2.5%. So we spent $1.5 trillion, got half a point of growth. That's over with. Now we're back down to 2% and we're facing an election. Well, just coming back to what does this mean for businesses? You know, what may be you know, a slowdown, a modest or, or even a severe one mean for, for businesses uh, like ours? Um, Glenn, Glenn's probably a little bit different um, and maybe to be a bit controversial. I mean, I think one of the things that's happened as a result of cheap money and what is likely to be continuous cheap money is the rise of private equity. And I don't know what private equity accounts for, you know, I've seen statistics that people say it's around 10 or 15%. I think they're pretty vacuous statistics, but it's maybe directionally, right? Maybe Glenn knows what the number is. But, you know, of the economy, private equity is a growing, let's say, 10 to 15%. And if you look at the time horizons of private equity, 
uh, they're around five, six, seven years, that sort, sort of level. And I think uh, we've become far too short term. And I think if you're looking at it, it from the point of view of where does a business go in this sort of dampen, let's call it a dampening economy, um, whatever we think about Trump, and whatever we think, whether we think the, 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 the st fiscal stimulus was in the wrong year, whether it should have been uh, 2020 or 18 or whatever, and whether it didn't yield a sufficient return. The America has become relatively, if I look at it from a point of our business, 70% of our business is in the Americas. So that's North and South America. And South America is really interesting. It's dis despite the turbulence, despite the political turbulence in Mexico, Bolivia, Venezuela, Argentina, etc., uh, there is more inflation there, and there is more pricing power for our clients, and there is more inherent flexibility. So you have a bit more wiggle room, if I can put it crudely. That so I look at the Americas. That's seventy percent of our business. Western Europe is twenty percent, and Asia is ten. Now, where do I want to get it? And just taking in, 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 into account any dampening, I would want it 40, 20, 40. So 40 in the Americas, 20 in Western Europe, and 40 in Asia. But why? In a dampening world, and I just give you the analogy, you know, we're a purely digital business. The ad market in America in the first half of this year grew by about 6%. Traditional media was down three, and digital was up 20. So I believe in pushing on an open door, and we're in the 20% growth sector. Likewise, the world economy. If things dampen, and let's say it dampens to one or two, there are going to be parts of the world that are growing significantly faster than other parts. So where are they? They, to my mind, would continue to be North America. Some of the predictions I've seen for the US economy, actually, is sort of in the 2 to 3% range in the coming year or so, and actually strengthening. Latin America... Asia Pacific. I wouldn't be, and maybe this audience doesn't like to hear this, but I wouldn't be a bull of uh, continental Europe. The, the, the issues, you know, you look at European, Western European share of global GDP been in continuous decline for the last few years, and I think it is likely to continue. The UK is going to have a, a struggle if we do come out which looks more and more likely, but if we do come out, it's going to have more and more struggles, certainly for five, in my view, five to ten years. But then, Singapore on steroids, I won't go through that, that argument, but if they can reposition the economy, the UK economy, away from Western Europe to those, I think, relatively stronger areas of the Americas and Asia-Pacific, Africa and the Middle East, and maybe even parts of Eastern Europe, raise polit big political issues, then I think um, the, the prospects of the UK economy actually would be better in the long run. But the, but the geographical focus of our business, and I think most businesses, is going to be the Americas and Asia Pacific. And Western Europe, I think, is in a, is in a tough spot. Do you broadly agree with that, Glenn? I, I don't think that's wrong. I mean, it's one of the problems with that analysis. I think that's actually right. I mean, I think the... Um, uh, one of, uh, I'm here to learn about France, uh, not to tell people about it, uh, but one of the questions you asked, or one of your colleagues asked me as an, um, before this was, why is you, the growth in the United States so good? And we don't think it's particularly good. Um, so the questions I've been getting from Europe are, uh, suggest that their, their situation is considerably worse than one that we think is not particularly good. Um, but the only thing I would take dip, so separately from this is, I think there's a major structural problem as between the United States and China, both economically and from national security perspective. Perspective that's not going away anytime soon. That's going to uh, create enormous inefficiency as supply chains are restructured and economic relationships become considerably more con uh, conflictual. So you have to think about that too as you um, think about the relative growth rates and opportunities in both. That's already in happened. That's it's already happened. It's already happened. But it's, I think it's going to be increasingly part of the dynamic in the future. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's a real uh, important point because most of our clients, their number one, two, or three market will be China now. So in the future, if this conflict does continue, which I believe it will, I think it's, it's irreconcilable, actually. And, and now their number one, two, and three competitors are probably Chinese. 
That's exactly right. That's and, the problem. And, and the global expansion. You know, remember, people say Google and Facebook do not have Chinese businesses. That's complete nonsense. Their second biggest profit pools are outbound Chinese companies. And Amazon is growing its relationship. Outbound Chinese. So Chinese companies going for global expansion. It's a huge profit pool for the platform. It's, it's a major inflection point in the global economy at this moment, which is worth really understanding, which is we managed since the accession of China to the WTO in the early 80s, uh, early, I'm sorry, the early 2000s. Uh, we've managed the, the global rise of China. Now we are managing the competition of China and China as a capital provider to, uh, with the rest of the world. Yeah, no, That's no. a very important point. American businesses were willing to put up with a lot of stuff, theft of intellectual property, uh, joint venture requirements, all these kind of things to get to the Chinese market. Now that they're there, they understand that those, uh, and China is powerful, that that tilts a set of economic relationships fundamentally against them. And that's now a new phase of a, a big competition. The thing, big thing in the trade talks was IP. Well, the horse is out of the stable. I mean, the IP argument had that, you know, if the Chinese stole IP, you know, they've stolen it. They got it. And they've got it. <laughs> and they, well, maybe with the exception of semiconductors, where they still have to play catch up. But, you know, AI, you know, Steve Schwarzman endows whatever he put into the MIT school there because he's worried about America falling behind in terms of AI. So China actually has leadership in some of these technological areas and has, has gone beyond. But the major issue in the trade talks that's not going anyway anytime soon is the difference in model, uh, which the Trump administration has been pressing the Chinese to do something about and the Chinese will not, which is we have pri in, in the West we have private businesses going to market against other companies. In China, we have a coordinated private sector plus a public sector. Many of the companies are actually owned by the private, by the Chinese government. She has made a decision that they're not going to be privatized. So you have government plus business in a highly coordinated manner going, competing with just businesses uncoordinated with their governments. That's a fundamental model difference that's now reached a point at which it creates a real competitive a structural problem between the two economic models. And the other fundamental thing is when Xi uh, assumed complete power and longevity, uh, you know, this reinforced the Chinese long-term view. I mean, I, I, I think in relation, I don't know, but I guess the Chinese sit there and say, well, President Trump can be there for four years, he can be there for eight years, but eight years in the scheme of... A blink scheme, of an eye. Yes, a blink of an eye for the Chinese, and they, they're thinking way beyond that. Absolutely. Let me ask you about, we've talked a lot about what we're negative about and how there's a slowdown and there has been lots of negatives about climate change. I'm sure there'll be more during the course of this conference since we're trying to fix the world. Let me ask you in the coming year, what are you most positive about in the global economy and businesses' ability to cope with that challenge from your respective points of view? Well, I, I, I sort of said it in a way um, when... When I left WPP a year ago, I, you know, we looked at, so if I look at the WPP, that was sort of flat to up a little bit at that time in terms of like-for-like like growth on the top line. But within that, there were wild, wild gyrations and differences. And I mentioned them in the context of the US ad market. The fact is, you know, if I look at the digital platforms, Google, and Google in the last quarter grew its ad revenues by about 20%. Facebook grew its ad revenues despite the problems around Facebook, right? And remember, it has Instagram as well. So we saw a switch from Facebook to Instagram, but it's one and the same company, at least currently. Um, so that's growing at 30%. So the answer to your question is, I'm very, can remain, I have to be, I'm subjective, but I remain extremely bullish about the prospects for digital, the digital economy, digital transformation, business transformation, if you want to put it more grandly. And... My feeling is, and you know, I, I, I'm subjective about it, and therefore maybe I'm biased, but my sense is that if we do go into that dampening, let's say, next year, our clients, particularly those are, that have big legacy businesses, which my, my, there isn't a sector I can think of that isn't affected by the digital transformation, our clients will say, okay, life is going to get tough, but we might as well address this digital transformation issue or move from legacy 
or analog to digital faster. So I think the paradox is, or the sort of the strange thing that may happen is that it will accelerate the digital revolution. And the pace of the technological change in any event is speeding up. I mean, if I was talking to one package goods client in New York last week, and he said to me, uh, it's a major package goods company with a big US business, a big global business, big US, and, and concentrated uh, categories, uh, category. And he said to me, the decline in retail in the United States is accelerating to a degree that he never anticipated. So this pressure, and you see it in Western Europe too, if you talk to any of the package goods companies here in Western Europe and how they're dealing or not dealing with Tesco and Aldi and everybody else, this pressure is gonna intensify. So where I'm really bullish is this, this leg legacy, leg uh, this legacy or analog to digital business. <clears throat> Uh, you said to me that you're a fan of Bruce Springsteen earlier. Just like you. Yes. Yeah, just like me. Uh, and uh, I often think of a line of one of his songs, which is, we're, we're living in the future and none of this has happened yet. Um, and, what I, and what I mean by that is one of the great things about being a technology investor, where I've spent my career, is that you live in the future. Uh, none of it has happened yet, but you have a point of view, of, but you know what the future is going to bring. Uh, and so as I uh, look at what the future is bringing us, I have a huge amount of optimism around and excitement around three or four major places where I've been investing. Uh, the first is in the near term, um, the implementation of 5G technologies uh, is going to transform uh, the way in which we uh, do a whole bunch of things uh, with our mobile devices. Uh, I um, think it's, it's very, very important for those of you here who take some responsibility for the French economy, that which hasn't even transitioned yet, the 4G technologies, uh, that I had a discussion with uh, your current president before he was president about this, so that was a while ago, um, that it's really, really important that you make this investment because you will be way behind on the new business models that are gonna be developed as a consequence of being able to run over 5G technologies, one. two. Um, is the uh, application of, of the first round of artificial intelligence technologies, uh, and particularly their integration with, with uh, 5G, are going to be fascinating. Uh, if you have a chance, have a look at this product that's uh, come out of a Chinese company called ByteDance. The product is called TikTok. It's, TikTok the first, yeah. it's the first major application of artificial intelligence technologies at scale, uh, and it just gives you some, it's magical, it gives you some sense of what can be accomplished. Um, and then additionally, I'm very, I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see the first major uh, implementations of some of the cryptocurrency technologies to the financial services industry in ways that are transformative. Uh, people will start to really understand uh, the importance there. Uh, and then on the um, drawing board for the future, don't uh, just understand that the proven um, application of quantum computing in the laboratory uh, is real now. We're not quite exactly sure why those two particles can be in the same places at two different times, different places at different times. But we're starting to understand how that can be employed uh, predictably for computing, and that's going to be fundamentally transformative. So that purports to me to be a world that's extremely exciting for the future. One last thing I would say the Boston Celtics in the early season are 8 and 1. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to a really good season uh, for, the, for the balance of this uh, basketball season. Just one thing on ByteDance. So we just won the creative assignment in, uh, in China, in Shanghai, in the office we have in Shanghai. It's an annual uh, creative assignment. And it's the development. And ByteDance is still a private company. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting because TikTok is an example. You know, people talk about the dominance. The regulators talk about the dominance of the three big platforms, Google, Facebook, Amazon in the West, uh, and Alibaba and Tencent in the east in China. TikTok's a good example of a, of a platform that has gained huge traction. In 500 quick... million users in 15 months. Yeah, huge 500 traction. 500 million customers in, in just over a year. In a nanosecond is another one of these blink of the right. eye things. So the, the, the technological landscape can change violently and quickly. Great. That was an amazingly lively conversation, gentlemen. Thank you very much for letting us hear you. So Martin Sorrell and Glenn Hutchins. And I guess, Glenn, the, what you're saying is if all else fails, there's always sport. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.